Hi, we're now going to go through some common types of computer system and do some evaluation of each of them. So first of all, let's go through some of the main, most obvious types of computer systems. By the way, just to be clear, a computer system is the combination of both hardware and software. And in particular, the hardware, which is presented to you, can be in different forms. So for example, a desktop computer, also called a tower, is the big box, which you've got a plug-in, a monitor, and a keyboard, and a mouse into. Well, the desktop itself is just that tower. We can plug in other devices called peripherals. The laptop, in comparison, has got the monitor and keyboard and mouse built in to its shell. Okay, so in terms of evaluation, right, a laptop is portable. You can take it around, it's got a battery. A desktop computer hasn't got a battery. It's got to get plugged in at all times, and so it's not nearly as portable. It's also much physically bigger than a laptop, but because you can use a full-size keyboard, a full-size mouse, a full-size screen, often a desktop is more productive because you can do more stuff. You've got a bigger screen. You can use a full keyboard. It might speed things up. It's why in offices, usually you've got desktop computers, whereas maybe at home or for people who travel, a laptop is a better solution. And of course, you've also got smartphones, which are computers nowadays. So a smartphone is ultra portable, but again, having a smaller screen and no keyboard might be a limitation. So you might get around that by having a tablet. A tablet, of course, has a bigger screen than a smartphone, but otherwise works in a very similar way. And to get around the slight issue of tablets without having keyboards and mice and so on, you've seen in recent years hybrid devices being put to market. So for instance, here is an iPad Pro with a keyboard attached and also you can get a little a mouse pad as well. Equally, some smartphones nowadays are folding, so they fold out to have a bigger screen to almost make it into a tablet. So you are seeing changes in order to try and you know, make the devices more well-rounded, I suppose. Okay, but hopefully you'll be able to evaluate these in terms of how they might get used, because all of these are computers, but each have their own pros and cons. One slight outlier, in that we are not going to use it ourselves necessarily as normal people, our servers. So a server is a powerful computer which does one job. It provides a service to people like us. So we'll look at servers in future videos, but often we haven't got much of a choice using a server. The other devices, usually it's our choice whether we want to use them or not. But a computer system which we have no choice about using because it doesn't really exist in a usable form yet is a quantum computer. So this is completely different to the other computers because it's still being researched and still being developed. But in 10, 20, 50 years, who knows, these might be much more widely used. This picture is of one by Google. You can see it's not, it doesn't look like a computer at all. Now what a quantum computer does and what makes it different is it does not use standard binary logic. So all of these other computers work using just binary and binary as we'll talk about in a future video just consists of zeros and ones so right now your computer is just using zeros and ones which is kind of crazy but actually a quantum computer does not use this system now because it's quantum it can be a little bit weird right quantum physics has some slightly strange behavior as you might know so a quantum computer does not use standard bits, binary digits, it uses instead qubits. A qubit is a quantum bit, and a quantum bit can be one or zero, like a bit, but also what is different is it can be both at the same time. So inside of a computer, it can be either one or zero or both is the difference in a quantum bit. It's just how particles behave at a very, very small scale. Very confusing. It's quite an advanced area of physics, as you probably are aware. Um, but it does enable us to massively speed up processing. Having the possibility to be in two places at once means you can do quite clever things and speed up processing. So there are certain problems which cannot get solved using normal computers, but could, people think, get solved using quantum computers because they work a little bit differently. But because we're dealing with very complicated physics at a very small level, 
these are much much harder to control it's nowadays quite simple to make a normal computer but much much harder to make a quantum computer they haven't really been fully made just yet but a computer which is in action and is really fast is a mainframe so a mainframe is a very large powerful computer used for large scale tasks so here is a picture of a couple of mainframes this one of the right is and one by IBM IBM make quite a lot of powerful computers this costs about hundred thousand pounds as far as I know some can be a lot more expensive so these are like servers but are usually even more powerful and are focused on processing so for instance a bank might buy a mainframe to do all of their transactions a supermarket might buy a mainframe to do all of their loyalty card information so sort of constant processing is done by a mainframe and these are really reliable the whole purpose is you can set up a mainframe and leave it for years and years and years it should just work all the time 24 7 with no issues so they're really reliable partly because they're designed with backups so inside the mainframe will be lots of backups there might be multiple cpus multiple storage devices so if one fails there'll be a backup device to use and also there'll be a team of people working on them so they're reliable because you've got people constantly fixing them and checking their working and all that sort of stuff so that's really a downside because they are complicated and have got advanced features you do need to have a team of people helping and supporting you can leave them but you do need people to be checking their working all okay so really powerful and really reliable but are complicated and are quite expensive so they can act in a very similar way to a server you could argue they are a server but most typical servers are not as powerful and do not need the level of support which a mainframe does and the final type I want to cover now is much more going back to stuff me and you could use potentially we're not going to use mainframes or quantum computers in our normal lives but we might use embedded systems relatively often so an embedded system is a computer within a wider system that performs a dedicated job so let's break apart what that means to give you an example which I like um, as an example is a hot tub so a hot tub of course is just like a big bath but with fancy features you've got some jets you've got some maybe LEDs you've got some uh, pff, heating um, as well now hot tub itself is a wider system so it's a system the hot tub itself is not a computer but inside the hot tub there will be a mini computer running the whole system so inside the hot tub there will be an embedded system the word embedded means inside something else and there'll be a little computer you can see the screen here running this hot tub okay so the computer does a, a dedicated job when a dedicated job that means it's doing one job and nothing else you can't play video games on a hot tub computer you can't check your emails you can't go on Twitter it's doing one job and that's running the hot tub so they're usually really simple and really basic computers now nowadays often we have quite a few embedded systems even in our house and they may work together as part of something called the Internet of Things IOT so the Internet of Things is the idea that many many simple embedded systems are nowadays able to connect and work together as part of a network so for instance in your house you might have a fancy toaster or a fancy microwave which is an embedded system and maybe the idea is that could connect to other devices in your kitchen so if you've got a fancy kettle or a fancy oven or a fancy toaster they may communicate in some way to decide when to turn on or turn off or things like this another example might be in a car most modern cars have got lots and lots and lots of embedded systems things like managing the windscreen wipers the sat nav the headlights the brake fluid like all, all sorts of stuff are being managed by embedded systems again you might be able to communicate with your car from your phone from your laptop remotely through the internet that's the idea of the internet of things another example might be in your house a smart light bulb which 
Again, it could be part of the Internet of Things. Generally, things which are called smart mean they are embedded systems and are part of the Internet of Things. You can control the lights from your phone. The lights might communicate with something like Alexa, some other system to work together. And a final example, which is not of Internet of Things because most of us don't have planes, but going back to just typical embedded systems, often the computers and things like planes or other advanced machinery can be considered embedded systems. You know, the autopilot, for example, is a basic computer which can't do anything else. All it does is make sure the plane flies and it's inside the plane. The plane is our wider system. Okay, so bear in mind, you know, embedded systems are very simple and are inside other devices or other systems, not always computers, but they may, in some cases, especially inside the home, work together as part of the Internet of Things.